Hi, welcome to Watch It Played. My name is Rodney Smith. In our series, we take a game, we show you how it's played, and then over the following episodes, we play the game and, where possible, put a seat at the table just for you so you can play along with us and help us make some of the gameplay decisions between the episodes. By doing so, we believe that you'll be able to decide for yourself whether or not a game would be a good fit for you, your family, or your gaming group. Now, in this series, we're going to be playing Descent, Journeys in the Dark, 2nd Edition by Fantasy Flight Games. Here, one to four players will control the heroes on an adventurous quest, and one player will be the Overlord, controlling the monsters and hazards that they're going to face. The game comes with several adventures, and you can play them as single quests, or string several of them together to create a campaign, where players, both Overlord and heroes, will gain new powers and abilities to aid them until the final battle, where one side will be declared the victor. In this series, we're going to be playing a single quest, and in this video, I'm going to focus on how you set up the game to play. But there are important rules here, so I hope you'll stick around, and when we come back, we'll go over how to set up the table to play Descent. To play Descent, you need one player as Overlord, and we're going to set things up assuming that we have three players controlling the heroes. So the first thing we have to do is pick a quest to play from the quest guide. There are several to choose from, but we're going to play the Twin Idols. At the bottom of the page, we see the dungeon that the quest will take place in, and this is made up from tiles that come with the game. These are double-sided, but in the corners you'll find a code. And this matches what is shown in the quest book, so you can easily assemble the dungeon. And there you have it. The dungeon is formed. In the quest guide, it does show other things that need to be added to the dungeon. For example, this red bar here represents a door. So we take one of the supplied door tokens and add it to the dungeon. These other tokens will be added in a moment, but let's look at how we set up the heroes. Each of the possible heroes in the game come with a hero sheet. Each player is going to pick one of the heroes to control, unless there's only one hero player, in which case they'll control two of the characters. In this case, our heroes have chosen Grisban the Thirsty, Avric Albright, and Leoric of the Book. Now the players can customize their hero by picking a class for it. Notice the heroes have a background color behind their portrait and a symbol to match. This represents their archetype. This is the color and symbol for a warrior, and this is the color and symbol for a mage archetype. As an example, our warrior hero can then pick to be either a knight or berserker class by claiming one of these decks of cards that match the color and symbol as shown on the hero card. Our dwarf, Grisban, will claim the berserker class, so we can return these cards back to the box. No other warrior hero can now claim the Berserker class, so players will need to come to an agreement or choose randomly. Here are all the cards for the Berserker class. And from this deck, we take the equipment card. This is easy to identify. It has a picture on it, as well as the starting skill. This you can distinguish from the rest of the skills because it doesn't have an experience symbol as shown on these cards here. These cards are only used if you're playing a full campaign. They give you additional abilities that you can add to your hero while they adventure. So we can return these to the box. Now each hero takes an activation card and the tokens that match it. Which set you choose is irrelevant. These will just allow the players to uniquely identify their own tokens when required to place them on the map, as we'll see in later episodes. Each hero has an unpainted miniature to represent it. Our miniatures were painted for us by Peninsula Painting Services. The heroes are then placed on the entrance tile as shown here in the quest guide. Each tile has a series of squares indicated on it, and the players place their heroes on the entrance tile, one per square, in whatever arrangement they choose. But hey, it's not all about the heroes here. Our overlord needs to set up as well. And that starts by choosing the monsters. 
In the quest guide, it tells us that the Overlord will use the Ettons and one open group. The Ettons are simple. No choice there, they must be used. Each monster has two cards to represent them, an Act 1 and an Act 2 version. The Act 2 cards are only used in a campaign to represent the monsters getting more and more powerful, so we'll ignore them during this quest setup and instead collect the Act 1 monster cards only. Now we get to pick one open group, and this is where we have some choice. Here are the other Act 1 monster cards, and if we flip them over, we'll notice at the top they have some symbols. These symbols represent the monster's traits, and at the top of the quest book page, you can see some of these traits are shown. So I'll be able to pick any one of these monsters that has at least one of the symbols shown here. So I've decided that I'm going to choose the cave spiders. Now we need to collect the monster's miniatures. This part of the card here shows you how many and which kind to take based on the number of heroes. The top part of the symbol shows you how many heroes you have in the party. We have three heroes, so we'll be looking at these numbers here. There are also both minion and master versions of the monsters. The number with the yellowish backing is the number of minion monsters you collect, and the number with the reddish backing is the number of master monsters you collect. The miniatures in the game come unpainted, so it's quite easy to tell the master monsters from the minion monsters. But even though my miniatures are painted, the trim around the base reminds us that this is the master monster, and these are the minion monsters. So for this game, I'm told I will collect one master monster and three of the minion monsters, so I'll remove this minion from the game. And likewise with the Etten, I'm told I can collect one master version of the miniature. The setup section of the quest tells the Overlord where to place the monsters at the beginning of the adventure. We're told to place the Etten anywhere within the Etten's lair, which is this tile here, as indicated by the note. The open group is then placed on the stairs tile, but we're told they must be placed as close as possible to the exit tile, as indicated here. And in case you haven't guessed already, I'm going to be playing the Overlord in our playthrough. So I'm going to place the Etten here in his lair next to the fire. I'm sure even monsters like to stay warm. And then I'm going to put the spiders as close to the exit tile as possible in this arrangement here. The setup also explains that I need to choose one of the monsters from my open group to carry this token known as the Idol of Skulls. And so I will give it to this monster here by placing it under its base. And speaking of tokens, we have others to place as well. These symbols on the map here with the numbers and the stars represent search tokens, like this token here. A star on a search token symbol, unlike those marked with a number, indicate that these will likely be used in some way towards the quest's objective. In this case, one of them will be the key. Most search tokens are the same on both sides, but one of them is unique. As you can see, on one side it shows the key symbol, but on the other, it looks like a regular search token. So we'll need to collect as many of these tokens as there are stars. So a total of three, ensuring that one of them is the key. The Overlord is allowed to know the exact location of the special token, but should ensure the heroes are sufficiently confused about which one it is after they're placed on the map. Then, based on the number of heroes on the adventure, additional search tokens are placed on the numbered spaces. We have three heroes, so we will place this search token, but this would only be used if you had four heroes. After placing our search tokens, then we can see in the quest book we have to place another token with this symbol, and it goes here behind the door. So there it is, and that's all of the tokens that we need to place. Next, we have a series of rules specific to the quest, explaining things like how these idle tokens work and what the key is used for. There's also a section for reinforcements. This outlines how the Overlord can bring more monsters into the dungeon, as well as the victory conditions, so you know when either the heroes or the Overlord has won the game. But we'll look at these in a later episode. For now, let's finish the Overlord's setup. These are the Overlord cards. Fifteen of them are labeled as basic, right here in the bottom left-hand corner of the card. 
The rest of them have different labels on the bottom. These you can return to the box. They're only used in campaign play so that as Overlord you can add to and customize your deck with more varied and dangerous effects that you can inflict on the heroes. These Overlord cards are then shuffled and then to create an opening hand I will collect one card for each hero on the adventure. So a total of three. Now we just need to set up the rest of the tokens and cards on the table. So here's the rest of the setup complete. We've put out our damage and fatigue tokens. We've taken all of the search cards and shuffled them, placing them face down to form a search deck. And over here we have our four condition decks. Each card within these decks is identical, so you don't need to shuffle them. Just make sure you have the matching tokens nearby as well. And finally, we have the dice. And now you're ready to play. After completing Encounter 1, you would then go over to the next page and set up the second and final part of the quest, Encounter 2. However, based on the outcome from this first encounter, either the heroes or the overlord will have a unique advantage as they go into the last part of the quest. Whoever wins Encounter 2 is considered the winner of that adventure. Well, I hope this was very clear. If you have any questions about the setup at all, please don't hesitate to ask them in the comments. I'd be happy to answer your questions as soon as possible. When we come back in the next episode, we're going to go over exactly how you play Descent Journeys in the Dark. I hope you'll join me. And until then, thanks for watching.